I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I'd like to speak to a couple of questions that have come in to the chat and then move into uh, my talk. Uh, first question came in, um, let's see, 27 minutes past the hour uh, from Liz. And um, she asked if I made a comment yesterday uh, in a question and answer session related to the Foundations of Wellbeing program, uh, did I say that depression uh, could be considered in some senses a learning disorder? And yes, I did. And that's a term that I've heard from others. It has to be understood in context. It has to do with the fact that very often when we're uh, depressed, um, or probably you could apply this also to chronic anxiety, um, when we're depressed, uh, mildly to moderately, very often people are experiencing useful, beneficial, enjoyable things, but they don't last. They don't seem to sink in. They don't seem to move the needle in a lasting way. And uh, so much of what life is about is taking in the good to grow the good that lasts. But people who are depressed, they're experiencing the good. The song is playing in the inner iPod, but the iPod is not recording it. They are not learning from it. There's not a change over time that moves from states to traits. So one of the theories around why um, exercise and movement tends to be a positive factor in reducing depression is that exercise and movement tends to promote neurogenesis, the birth of baby neurons and their survival uh, in the hippocampus of the brain, which is a major part of the brain that's involved in the formation of, of, of learning, the development of learning over time, including the registration of lived experience. So that's something to think about when we approach um, life in general, and also as we approach uh, dealing with chronic issues, how do we help our brains embedded in our living body? How do we help the whole system become more uh, positively susceptible to beneficial change? If we start out with a brain that's like Velcro for negative experiences, but Teflon for positive ones, susceptible, biased, in other words, toward negativity, are there things we can do to um, change the brain, literally, physiologically, neurologically, so that it's less reactive to the negative and increasingly reactive to the positive in terms of uh, shifts that stick? and last over time. And one of the factors of that is movement and exercise. Another factor is playfulness. Wow, playfulness tends to encourage uh, the release of what are called neurotrophic factors um, in the brain that promote growth and change. So if we're being playful in some ways, uh, while we are um, experiencing things that are beneficial, that is gonna tend to increase bit by bit, uh, their registration is lasting changes of neural structure and function, Whoop, steepening the learning curve. That's really interesting. Not uh, fake playfulness, not faking it till you make it, but a genuine spirit of um, discovery, you know, curiosity, creativity, um, holding things lightly, even gamifying you know, your, uh, your meditation or anything else in life, like, can I just do four breaths in a row? Okay, can I do five in a row or I'm staying present before I get, whoops, hijacked? Um, anything, so playfulness. And then a last factor I'll just mention um, in passing here, which will come to me is novelty. Yes, which overlaps playfulness, a sense of not knowing. I could have qualities of delight or awe, just don't know. And if we're in a state of beginner's mind, as Suzuki Roshi put it, there too, the brain, is to, it's a novelty detector. It registers what's fresh, what's new, what defies expectations, what um, violates predictions. I'm gonna be getting to predictions 
the brain is a prediction machine in a minute here. Um, yeah, so bringing a, an attitude of, oh, don't know, or oh, curiosity, uh, beginner's mind, don't know mind, to the next moment or the next aspect in our practice, that too could help foster a brain that's more sensitive to positive change based on the experiences we're having at the time. Pretty good stuff. Okay. So I want to use that as kind of, sort of, a segue into two quotations that I dropped into, um, let's see, uh, someone, uh, two quotations I dropped into the chat uh, at, just as we started, I'll put them in the chat again. Let me just check something quickly. Okay, great. So um, where am I here? I'm going to put them in the chat again. Good. So these are two quotations that I, I get a quotation every day, which I recommend it, kind of like the daily word uh, in terms of um, early Buddhism, uh, from Pariyati, P-A-R-I-Y-A-T-T-I. -I. There we go. Uh, and anyway, so a few days ago, I got this quotation from the Dhammapada. Calm is one's thought, calm one's speech, and calm one's deed, who, truly knowing, is wholly freed, perfectly tranquil, and wise. These are words, I'm sure edited a little, at least, but these are the words of the Buddha, or certainly the Buddhist dream from early Buddhism that were orally transmitted and passed down for centuries before a surviving written record of them was made. And I like to imagine that this is the voice of people chanting and speaking with each other and, and repeating the teachings from thousands of years ago, going all the way back to the mind stream of the root teacher, Shakyamuni, the Buddha, the one who knows himself. Buddha comes from the word Buddha, which means knowing, knowing. It's kind of wild, right, to, um, to feel that. So uh, that's the first, so I, you can feel the weight of that quote. And I'll come, and then I'll, there's the other one I dropped in as well, which is let go of the past, let go of the future, let go of the present, and cross over to the farther shore of existence. Wow. With mind wholly liberated, you shall come no more to birth and death. I'd like to explore these two with you in a kind of experiential inquiry or reflection. Okay? As context, um, I remember in the process of writing my book, Hardwiring Happiness, almost 10 years ago now. Yeah, 10 years ago, at least. And um, I was talking with my editor and we were talking about, you know, taking in the good to grow the good that lasts. That's the topic of that book. And I wanted to zero in on um, benefits of that, that people cared about. And, you know, I was abstractly going into things like liberation, <laughs> cosmic consciousness. She was like, forget about it. This was a New York editor for Penguin Random House. Forget about it. I want to be calm. <laughs> you know, people want to be calm these days. They're like rawr, running around, hamster wheels, you know pressured by this or that, rattled, what up, right? Calm. So calm is a beautiful thing. Calm is a really beautiful thing. So I'd like to unpack this quotation with you in, in some ways and invite you into what calm or greater calm of thought, word, and deed would be for you applied to something that's challenging. So think about a relationship, Think about uh, anguish, about events in the world, close to home, far away, oh, maybe a health worry, financial concern, 
um, estrangement in your family system, whatever it might be, a visit, an impending visit to the dentist perhaps. Let's apply these teachings to that particular situation. So first of all, let's start with calm and notice the structure of this statement here. And from time to time, maybe other people will put these quotations into the chat for those who maybe are just joining us and are not able to see previous chat. So we have calm as one's thought, speech, and deed, part one, who truly knowing is wholly freed, perfectly tranquil and wise. Those two parts go both ways. It looks like calm comes from truly knowing, being wholly freed. That's true. On the other hand, deepening in a genuine calm, not suppressing anything, but calming the turbulence in the mind and increasingly grounding in the calm space in which turbulence is occurring, that helps us be truly knowing of the streaming of experience and freed in our relationship to it. So they go, it goes both ways. Calming is really important on the path of awakening. Um, in the Buddhist tradition, there are seven factors of awakening. Um, mindfulness, investigation, energy or determination, you could think of it, application. Um, tranquility, bliss, equanimity, and deep, deep uh, transformational um, concentration of mind. Wow, tranquility. Calm is one of the seven factors of awakening. So I want to invite you to consider this thing that's challenging, this person, the situation, the condition. Just and take a moment here. I'll be quiet with you. And consider what it would be like to relate to that person or situation while being calmer in your body, less revved up, less accelerating, less pressured, calmer in your body, less speedy, less stressed in your body, what would that be like? applied to this particular person or situation or concern. And I'm speaking of a genuine calm here. You know, whatever's within reach. Like we, we, we can calm down. We can imagine what it would be like to be calmer in us in our bodies. We can be aware of other people who are grappling with similar things but seem to have a, a genuine calm uh, or a greater calm than we do about it. So it's, it's authentic, it's real. Also imagine being calmer in speech, less hot-headed, less fearful. Fearful is not calm. You know, calm includes matter-of-factly naming what's true as you see it, matter-of-factly naming your values, what you care about, why things matter to you, what matters to you, and then calmly um, stating uh, what you're going to do or what you request that others do. So calm does not mean biting your tongue or muzzling yourself. In fact, as we've seen again and again and again, it's when people speak with the gravitas, you know, this, the seriousness, the dignity of, of calm, 
confidence. Uh, words carry great weight. Right here, I'm thinking of uh, many examples of um, indigenous leaders, indigenous people, uh, sp speaking with great weight. And, I, and it's interesting. I, I um, there's there's a there may there may be an appropriate, well deserved sense of injustice and fieriness there, but somehow there's a there's a weightiness to the words. So imagine yourself in your way, being calmer in your speech. I I have made many mistakes in my life, um, not being calm in my speech. Okay, and then also imagine uh, being calmer in your thoughts. Especially calmer in your intentions, your your inner world. <clears throat> the Buddha placed great emphasis on intention, um, conscious, deliberate intention. So, what would it be like to be calmer? I mean, for me, that means you know disengaging from a pounding righteous case, like a prosecutor. Uh, um, not reducing another person to like a two-dimensional thing, but rather retaining a sense of their beingness altogether that promotes greater calm. Not blowing things out of proportion in your mind. Calm. You know, you might be making a little list here. <laughs> you know? Maybe on a little three by five card to carry with you, <laughs> and the next time that other person is on the phone, you know, or or the next time you 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 get an email from them or whatever it might be, um, what would that be like for you to be calmer in your mind, including in your intentions related to this this challenge? Okay, so second, now that we've explored what it would be like, what would help you be calmer in general and applied to this particular person? A regular practice of meditation is a real factor for most people of developing greater inner calm in the, as their resting state and then greater capacity to return to that calm if they've been perturbed or jiggled away from it. Regular meditation. Uh, it helps to take good care of the body as best you can, feed it well, sleep it well, pleasure it well. Um, Rest it well, as best you can. Um, tend to its needs, including its medical or healthcare needs. That, that's a factor of helping the body be calmer. So you might think about um, your particular challenge. What would help you be calmer? in dealing with it. Maybe a sense of perspective, like, you know, uh, reminding yourself of having done everything you could already. Or if there are things you really haven't done that you could do, do them. I know, easier said than done, but still, the bliss of blamelessness, as the Buddha put it, is very calming. <laughs> It could be poignant. Your heart could still be broken. Uh, you could still um, be really worried about people you love while finding the refuge, the calming refuge in knowing that you've done what you can. So I'm really inviting you to bring it down to earth here, get real, 
what would help you be calmer around certain things that are really disturbing you? You know, there's a key phrase from the Buddha that's come down to us in which he described his own practice. And as it progressed, uh, to paraphrase, things uh, he would experience, disturbing, painful, wrenching, racking things, but they would not invade his mind and remain. They would not invade into the core of himself. And they certainly would not remain. They would not remain. All right? So what would help you not let various things invade your mind and remain, disturbing your calm, your inner calm? For example, uh, classic, don't talk about money just before going to sleep in your couple. Oh, wow. Another, um, my wife and I have kind of a rule that past a certain time at night, we just don't talk about certain things. <laughs> you know, uh, worries about our kids, you know, the state of the world. We just, nah, <laughs> you know, unless the house is burning down, we just, Nah, and it's not. Uh, we don't talk about stuff past a certain time because it just invades the mind uh, as you're trying to kind of do, 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 settle down, you know, so that you can sleep. Um, okay. Um, yeah. What helps your body be calmer, your speech be calmer, and your mind be calmer? So it's helpful, including applied to particular things. Okay. And then I'd like to segue from here, and then I'm going to open it up uh, to questions, conversation with you about particular, you know, nightmare scenarios, real things. Um, actually, I want to say one more thing about calm that um, has really helped me, really helped me a lot. It's to experience many times a day uh, for very often just a second or two or three at a time, what I would call deep green, which is the sense in the present of being of a mind that's free of craving, a mind that's free of pressure, discontent, um, overwhelm, panic, anger, worry. So in the moment, you're kind of dropping in to a felt sense of, um, of a deep restedness in the body. And that's our home base. So this is not some airy-fairy thing. This is our natural state, our home base, when we're not uh, in the present feeling that something is missing or wrong. So I deliberately cultivate the felt sense of uh, being peaceful, content, and rested in love. Because it, it, when you are experiencing peace, contentment, and love in that moment, uh, it, your three basic needs for safety, satisfaction, and connection feel like they're being met. Deep green. It's like training the body, especially since much of our days are spent in a kind of pink zone, not not always a red zone, but a pink zone where we're stressed and kind of pressured and not very calm. So multiple times a day, maybe just before you get out of bed, maybe just before you get into bed at night, and other times during the day, whew, reset to deep green, the green zone, deep calm, restedness enoughness. That's a really, really fantastic practice for building up a kind of muscle, you know, of the trait of calm, genuine calm. Okay. Then the next quote, and I'm going to put it into the chat again. This one is really deep. I debated whether to get into it, but I thought, yeah, let's go for it. So 
Here's the second quotation. Uh, let go of the past. Let go of the future. Let go of the present and cross over to the farther shore of existence. With mind wholly liberated, you shall come no more to birth and death. This is a profound proclamation. Let's see if we can make sense of it. In ordinary terms, if we let go of the future and let go of the past and let go of the present as it is occurring, we are then uh, right at the emerging edge of now, continuously, Whew, right in the present. And as we do that, we step out of the evolved neuro neurobiological prediction machinery of the brain. A lot of new research and modeling of the brain and cognitive neuroscience has to do with the ways in which the brain is continually predicting uh, uh, what we will be seeing or feeling. And it's also predicting um, how certain things will come out. And one of the recent theories about why psychedelic assisted therapy can be potentially really helpful for some people, certainly for depression, perhaps other issues as well, is that under the influence of psilocybin or other um, psychedelic agents, uh, what happens in certain key networks of the brain that, that, that are particularly related to the sense of self and predictions related to um, the presumed self, those predictions in, a little technical here, in terms of Bayesian mathematics where you have your priors and then you're updating uh, with new information, all right? Uh, there are what are called weighted priors. That is a very cool, geeky phrase, weighted priors, which have to do with our presumptions, our expectations, our assumptions, our models that we're stuck in or so forth that are heavily weighted. So that, uh, for example, if your weighted prior is that you're not very lovable and no one will really like you, uh, if you meet you know, 20 people, and 19 of them are friendly and positive and affirming and seem to find good in you, okay? Uh, eh, you know, eh, bounces right off the weighted prior. But if that one person in 20 seems a little dismissive or uninterested or bored or, you know, even a little, huh, you know, puts you down, ha, that confirms the weighted prior, all right? And psychedelics seem to have perhaps a particular capacity under certain conditions for certain people to kind of disrupt the weighted prior. This is a very powerful way to think about your mind in general. What are your weighted priors? Now, there's a place, I think, for positively weighted priors based on um, predictions. <laughs> if the truth is, <coughs> pardon me, you have successfully managed 19 out of 20 of you know normal range conflicts with other people, well, you could have a 95% likelihood that the next normal range conflict you step into, you will successfully manage. So you could, you know, that's a productively weighted prior. In any case, when we're really in the present, we're just out of that whole prediction machinery, right? There's a kind of complete, profound inner freedom when we're not in the future, we're not worrying about the future, we're not predicting a future, and also we're not ruminating about the past, which weights our priors. Those ruminations about the past, um, you know, deepen as we run laps around the rumination track, we deepen those tracks every time we go around them, further weighting our presumptions or expectations, which are negatively weighted. And so right in the present, we're out of the prediction machine. We're right with what is continually emerging. You know, often with a sense of awe, beginner's mind, don't know mind, and delight. Right there, really really powerful. 
and then the Buddha drops in the farther shore of existence. What in the world is that? Now, maybe it's just metaphorical. I don't think so. I think he was pointing to what he routinely pointed to, at, including with the metaphor of crossing over the river of suffering to the unconditioned, that which is not subject to arising and passing away, that which is timeless, eternal, a fundamental ground. That was how he described it. He left it at that. Other people in other traditions and to some extent later in Buddhism um, have spoken about qualities of awareness, even love, as innate uh, attributes of that unconditioned ground. Just staying with what the Buddha explicitly said, as best we know, uh, in early Buddhism, um, that farther shore of existence is the unconditioned. It's timelessness. It's nirvana. Wow. So in addition to the everyday benefits of really, really dropping into the present, um, it is a portal, a gateway, a path to the ultimate liberation of the mind and heart. Wow. You know, in the, in the radical present, in the emergent present, we're not constructing anything. We're not making anything with the mind. We're not tilted into becoming. Um, as Suzuki Roshi put it, I'm not sure there are enlightened beings or I am, um, I am not sure there are awakened beings. I am sure there are awakened moments, he said. One of those, a category of awakened moments is being radically in the present without any mental time travel. It's, a, it's that profound. Of course, if we're agitated and not calm, it's really hard to be in the present. And being in the present promotes calm in a lovely upward spiral, a positive cycle. You know, it's really easy to just sort of hear teachings, almost like I think about the, you know, the idea of samplers, you know, these sort of needlepoint uh, sayings, uh, be nice. You know, they're put on the wall. You know, look at them, yeah, be nice, whatever. Ah! You know, uh, it's, it's, or to turn things in like, you know, Hallmark card sentiments and so forth. It's easy to take something like the Buddhist teaching about calm or being in the present and go, oh yeah, whatever, you know, be nice, be in the present, be calm, whatever, right? No, these are instructions from the great teacher. This is, these are, these are um, offerings. These are breadcrumbs left by the great teacher uh, to the highest levels of realization. Calming in the present. In the present, calming. And then we have the other um, half of this uh, teaching from the Dhammapada here. With mind wholly liberated, you shall come no more to birth and death. There are two kind of levels for understanding that, at least two. With my limited understanding, there may be more. Uh, the first of them is very naturalistic. In other words, when we are um, unattached, when we are liberated in our relationship to whatever is occurring, the conditioned experiences that are arising and passing away. When we are liberated, when we are unattached, in other words, when we uh, are holding our experiences lightly, we are not clinging to them, we are not going to war against them, we're liberated, we're free in our relationship to what is passing through awareness at the time. When that's true, we're not... Um, getting caught up in birthing or constructing the next thing, nor are we caught up in the dying, the passing away of what has been. We're just whoosh, rested right here, right now. 
in that ordinary sense. In the further sense that I believe the Buddha was very clearly speaking to, consistent with a whole lot of his teaching, you know, he was in a frame in which the complete liberation of consciousness all the way meant an ending of the conditions that would lead to future rebirths. You don't have to buy that model. But um, for the Buddha, it was very matter of fact. He talked about rebirth a lot, previous births, future births. Um, <clears throat> and it's not that existence sucks so much that we're trying to get off the wheel. Later teachings in the history of Buddhism have you know, made more of that emphasis. It's No, it's not that. Um, the Buddha talked about that happiness visible in this present life, right? So it's not that we're trying to, you know, get off the wheel because life sucks. You know, there are aspects of life that are painful. Um, there are many aspects of life that are beautiful, enjoyable, interesting, vast opportunities to serve others. With the bodhisattva approach, for example, that came in centuries after the Buddha passed away, um, we're not trying to get off the wheel in a permanent sense. That said, um, even though it's not our intent, as the conditions that lead to rebirth gradually fade away, like the quenching, the extinguishing of a fire or a candle, as those causes and conditions gradually fade away, uh, then there is a gradual um, ending of the causes of rebirth in the model of early Buddhism. And one way to relate to this is, wow, that could be true. Okay. It's true enough that I'm going to take the next step. You could relate to it like that. Or you could simply relate to it that in a context in, in which the Buddha is really talking about ultimate matters here, he is saying to us that our growing capacity to let go of the past, let go of the future, and let go of the present as it continually changes. That can lead us onward into full awakening. It's that consequential. And in a certain kind of sense, when we're fully in the present, I'll leave it at that. Okay. I never know if, as I think to myself, going hardcore <laughs> is useful or wise, but there you are. Okay, let's see here. Um, I'm seeing all kinds of great comments in the chat. As usual, I ask you if you do you know, comment in the chat, be nice, focus on your own practice. Avoid persuading, advising, educating, teaching, or selling, uh, or criticizing other people. Okay, beautiful comments, everything. People are focused on what I'm talking about. Um, hey, uh, so I see a comment from Brenda, one minute past the hour. Hello, Dr. Brenda. And um, I would have to say that most of us did some uncalm speech today. <laughs> you know? uh, I, I let it a little slip myself. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, great. Elizabeth asks a wonderful question. One minute past the hour. How about when on stage giving a talk to a big audience, I still have stage fright even though I've done it many times, pounding heart, etc. I can relate to that. And um, I, what I think is interesting and possible is to be calm about not being calm. And to do a kind of a trick that weirdly works. There you are about to go on stage, let's say, or some other thing, your heart's beating and you're upset and you're irritated, you're rattled. You might ask yourself, okay, I'm not calm. I'm definitely not calm. Can I be calm about not being calm? Can I hold this agitation in a space, a ground, a container that is 
fundamentally at peace. No, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I cannot be calm about not being calm. All right. Can you, there's the trick. Then you go to the next level out. It's like Russian dolls or, you know, balls within balls within balls. You go out, can I be calm about not being calm about not being calm? It's a trick, but it works. And you usually get to a place of, oh, I can find some kind of ultimate context that can contain context of calm that can contain uh, everything else that's not calm. So that's really a key. And, um, you know, one way to um, help oneself too, to be calm about what is not calm, is to recognize the nature of being upset, having stage fright, being anxious, being worried about a dental appointment, being really angry, uh, being frozen. Um, all those experiences are made of parts that are connected and changing, kind of impersonally. And we don't have to identify with them. You know, there is stage fright. Here's another trick. I am scared. There is fear. You know, I have stage fright. There is stage fright. That shift, that little shift from I to there is, it's more impersonal. We're more disidentified from it. That can be really calming. To simple noting techniques. There's so much research evidence about this kind of thing that I'm describing here. Being able to just note to yourself while you're in an argument with someone, whew, there is the desire to whack them. <laughs> you know, there is, wow, there is a righteous case occurring in my mind about how dumb they are. Um, you know, noting what's happening. Wow, I really wish they agreed with me. There is the desire that they agree with me. That kind of noting or naming of what's happening helps you step back from it, which promotes calm. It's there. We're not suppressing it. We're mindful of it and not hijacked by it. There's a larger and larger space in which the upset is occurring. That's within reach. We practice a lot train and train and train. And frankly, the more our tendency is to not be calm, either by innate temperament and or life history, you know, um, the more we have those tendencies, you know, the, the more important it is to train in kind of an inner equanimity. I think about uh, the teachings. Um, I always, uh, Thurman, um, Howard Thurman, I think, in Los Angeles, I'm getting the name wrong. He said, look out at the world with quiet eyes. The world could be noisy, could be agitated, could be understandably, profoundly unjust and upsetting because of its injustice, but can we look at it with quiet eyes, calm eyes? All right. How are we about it? Okay, so let's see here. Lots of great comments. Calmer in thoughts is harder than calmer in speech, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's ultimately the origin of uncalm words and deeds is uncalm mind. Um, let's see. <clears throat> yes, wonderful comments. Great, great. Okay, what really matters here? Beautiful. You know, if you want to make a copy of the chat, a lot of great advice in the chat. Um, you go down to the bottom where your, you know, the message is, and there are these three horizontal dots at the very bottom of the chat window. If you click them, you could save the chat to somewhere on your computer. Um, yeah, great, excellent. Well, good. So, what do you think? Coming into the present, letting things get calmer finding that which is always calm. Awareness is always calm. The context of, contents of awareness rrr, can be turbulent, agitated, loud, jangly, really intense. But awareness itself, it's like the, the screen, you know, the, the, the screen of a television is itself calm, even if very disturbing images go through it. Um, 
awareness is always calm. And uh, it's my observation and consistent with the uh, neural architecture of consciousness that at the deeper levels uh, of that architecture, uh, it um, is uh, very calm in, in a very deep sense. It's, it's undisturbed. It's not agitated, partly because it's not representing a lot of content, way down deep. So you can feel it inside yourself. You can almost like you're going way back in time, you know, Maybe you're like a lizard doing little lizard push-ups or a jellyfish 600 million years ago in the primordial seas, just floating there, aware. That ground of awareness deep down inside, the core of your being, you can find there's a fundamental inner peace in you underneath it all, which may edge into some ultimate unconditioned, undisturbed, timeless ground of all. So, okay? Calm, finding calm, calming. One calm person uh, amidst a bunch of agitated people can really, really, really be helpful. Thich Nhat Hanh, bless his memory, talked about that. Refugee boats leaving Vietnam, agitated, the boat is starting to sink. If one person remained mindful and present and compassionate and calm, it could really, really help to save the whole ship. Don't, don't underestimate you know, the power of your own dignity, self-respect, and simple calm. You know, being clear about the limits of your power. One thing that really agitates us is to feel more responsible than we have the power to accomplish. A accepting helplessness and limits to our influence can help us deepen in our calm in ways that actually can benefit many other people. So calming in the present. The past is gone. The future is yet to be. Resting in the eternal present. Good. Really good. Down to earth, right? It's right here. It's not abstract, it's right here, it's real. And in all that, to finish, we can feel our relatedness to others. Right here, right now, several hundred of us um, joined in a community of practice together. Okay, well, thank you for your kind attention. I hope this was useful. And I think it is always useful to really stare at the words of the Buddha, including the most radical of those words, and to really feel into what that would be like for you or how you can gradually step into or have a moment of intuitive knowing of the trueness of what he is pointing to for you. That is a good thing. Even the most radical kind of freedom uh, and happiness and love that he is pointing to.